Y'all ready for the word? Let's praise God in advance for his word. So the first word that we're going to deal with here is Yahweh Suri. And when I got up this morning, uh, spirits started talking to me and I was um, just impressed to go in a slightly different direction than I did yesterday and, and really to take my time. And as I, I share with the earlier group, I, I understood why. So I'm feeling the same thing for this group. Everybody say Yahweh Suri. And that is the Lord is my rock. Let's look at Psalm 144, verse 1. What I've been trying to convey here with these names of God in terms of why they're important is that, again, Jesus says that he desired for us to know God. Well, the way that we know God is that we have to experience God. The way we experience God is he has to take us through some things. Yeah. And as you experience life's situations, the good and bad, you discover the character of God. And so the, the characters in the scriptures, as they went through things with God, they would name places and moments in remembrance of God and his, his character. And you've been in some places where you remember God specifically as this, and you remember God as this, and you, I mean, you can go back to a particular place, and that's how you got to know him. So as we go through these names, you'll be able to identify with these, I promise you, and his name, his power, his character, will become even greater in your heart, prayerfully, by the time you leave here today. Amen. David says this about God. Blessed be the Lord, my what? A rock is solid. What else is a rock? Strong. Hard. Enduring. Our God is strong and he is enduring. There's no other God like our God who's a rock. Um, when you look in the scriptures and in, in the biblical times, the rocks were for shelter, for shade, for safety. They even built things with rocks, altars, temples. Walls. God wanted to make sure that the Israelites did not forget how they got into the promised land. So when they crossed over, he had them to do what? Yeah, 12 memorial stones so that they could remember that God brought them over. I, I find it amazing that when he decided to give us the commandments, that he didn't engrave them in a tree. <laughs> he engraved them in a rock, in, in a stone. And Brother John hollered out yesterday that he is our rock. He is the rock of ages. Amen. Amen. David here says, blessed be the Lord, my what? My rock. Now, this is interesting. Who trains my hands for what? And my fingers for battle. Now, David, without a doubt, was a strong military person. He knew how to fight. And he brought down a Goliath uh, with his bare hands. He fought a bear and a lion. 
Um, he led his army into great battles, mighty man. But now he's not talking about a physical war here. He's talking about spiritual war. And that's where we need help. Amen. And some of you are in a battle right now. And God is going to give you help in terms of how to deal with that. Let's go to, let's see, 1 Samuel chapter 24. The entire passage is, is amazing to me. It speaks of David's adversary, Saul, who absolutely hated David because of his popularity and basically because of how God used him and how God was going to appoint him to be his successor. And he's so consumed with hatred for David that he literally goes after him. And here he is in this cave. He goes into this cave to relieve himself. And wouldn't you know that David is in that cave? David's men, 3,000 mighty men, say to him in verse... Let's see, verse 4. This is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. Yeah. Let me say that again. They said to him, behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver you, deliver your enemy into your hand and you can do whatever you want to him. And so here he is, David. He's in a vulnerable place. Getting. <laughs> and David got up secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. <laughs> the next verse. And it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut off Saul's robe. Mm. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, let me just pause right here. Listen, sometimes, and I've been here, sometimes you can get into circumstances where there are people against you or a person against you, and yet you have well-meaning friends, brothers and sisters, who will speak to you scripture on how to move. But it may not be in that moment for you to move on what they are saying. There has to be an application of wisdom to know the timing of God and specifically what God is desiring to do. Because it could be that God doesn't want you to touch that individual at all, but he wants to operate in a completely different way to move in their heart, but he wants to use you as an instrument 
to get into the heart. So you have to step back and really hear the voice of the Lord, Yahweh, who is our rock. And make sure you're not listening to the voices of your friends, your family. And you want to even be careful that you don't turn your voice into the voice of God. Are you listening? And it's, it's a really, really, it's a really difficult thing to navigate. But you have to hear God. Now, David is remorseful about it because he realizes, mm, I move prematurely and this is not what God desires. Let me give you something to write here. And uh, I referenced this book when I got here this morning. Um, it's called The Power of One Christian Life by Francis Frangipane. The Power of One Christian Life, Francis Frangipane. And he says this. The Father is not seeking opportunities to destroy us, but reasons for pouring out his mercy. I want you to get that down because I need you to say it back to me. And I need you to say it to yourself when you get in your car and when you get up in the morning. Again, the Father is not seeking opportunities to destroy us, but reasons to pour out his mercy. You got that? What did I just say to you? Say that again. To pour, he's looking for reasons to pour out his mercy. And oftentimes, he's looking for somebody to use to pour out his mercy. Could you be the person that God can use as a vessel to pour out his mercy? Well, when you're in a posture where you're ready to throw up your hands, that can happen. Repeat after me. God, not my will, will, but thine will be done. Say it again. Pastor, you don't understand. Write this down. God doesn't want us to be judgmental, but prayer mental. There there are times where the Lord wants you to step back and pray and get his wisdom on how to proceed in that situation. Amen. That, That takes maturity. It takes some. Amen. Everybody shout discipline. Say it again. I've taught you this several times, and it bears saying it again for a person that's in here going through something. Every conflict is an opportunity for God to be glorified. What did I just say? Every conflict is an opportunity for God to be glorified. 
Pastor, you, do you realize how this person has been coming for me? Every conflict is an opportunity for God to be glorified. And this is no time for you to practice taking off your earrings. I feel you. I'm, I, I, that's why I asked you to come close. <sighs> okay. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed. When the Lord has appointed somebody in a position, it's not yours to arbitrarily try to remove that person. As bad as you would like to, as even on paper when it looks like, as your buddies would say, this is the right time to do it and everybody's on your side. You want to make sure that God is on your side. Put him there. And so to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. David is really convicted. Verse 7. Are y'all still here? Yeah. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also arose and went after him and called him out. Now, I want y'all to pay attention to this, especially you hotheads. <laughs> My Lord, the king, that's how they would honor the king. And when he saw Saul, he looked behind him. David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. If you allow God, he will take away the rage and he can put you in a humble position. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Listen, yeah, you, you yield to God. He'll change your language. He'll clean your verbiage up. Amen. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. He'll clean up your verbiage. He'll cause you to put the crowbar down. The matches away. Gasoline, everything. <laughs> Praise God up in here. <laughs> and David said, Saul, I, King Saul, I don't understand why you listening to everybody that I'm trying to do you harm. Look, this day your eyes are seen that the, the Lord, the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. They said, kill you, and I could have taken you out. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord. For he is the Lord's anointed. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Verse 12. Next verse. Yeah, but you, <laughs> you want to take my life. And the next verse. 
Let the Lord judge between you and me and let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. Now, for that person that has been like this before you all week long and pushing up against you like this all week long. Your flesh and even friends say this is your opportunity to rise up. But I want you to say without saying that person's name, but my hand shall not be against you. Say it now. Shout it out again. Now, that could be a person on your job. That could be a person that's in your ministry. That can be a person in your home or in your family. And I need you to speak that word again. But my hand. And God had me to personalize this in the first service. And you're going to go further than your hand. But my mouth shall not be against you. Say it. But my mouth shall not be against you. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was kind of low key. <laughs> Say it again. My mouth. My thoughts shall not be against you. Say it. My thoughts shall not be against you. Say that again. Yeah, we'll say it again. Angie Brown says, say it again. So y'all say it again. <laughs> My thoughts shall not be against you. Yeah. Praise God for victory here as he's, he's moving in the house. If you can change, if you can change your thinking, you can change your words, you can change your actions, you can change and you can grow and God wants you to grow from the point where you're not looking for opportunities to destroy individuals, but to lift them up and to show mercy. Now, you know what? For many of us in the house today, that means major, major growth because you only knew how to operate in one mode. And that is, if you come against me, I'm going to get you. So praise God right now for your transformation that's, that's taking place. Amen. Let's watch God. Let's, let's watch God. How does, this, how does this turn out? And this really blesses me so much. Verse 13, it, it blesses me. As a proverb of the ancients says, wickedness precedes the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue, a dead dog or flee? Therefore, let the Lord be judge and judge between me and you and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. Now watch this. So it was when David had finished speaking. Saul said, is this you, David? And I want you to read that last line with me. What does it say? You see what happens when you get out of the way and you let God? He changes a person's heart. Here's a man that wanted to destroy David, and now this man is broken and weeping. He then said, David, you, <laughs> I admire your relationship with God. You've rewarded me with good. 
in spite of the fact that I've been so mean to you. You've shown this day how you've dealt well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you didn't take me out. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. <sighs> Lord have mercy. And he turns around and asks David for favor. I, I, and now I know indeed that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Therefore, swear to me by the Lord. Tell me, please, that you won't destroy my family when I'm gone. And that you won't destroy my name. Listen, get this in your mind. You don't have to put somebody else's light out to let yours shine. David swore to Saul, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hurt your family. Saul went home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. Now, what you've been fretting about and the ways that you have planned to destroy someone, put all of that aside. And you trust God to handle it. And you trust God to deal with their heart. Amen? Amen. And you praise God that he wants to use you. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But he wants to use you as a vessel of mercy and love. Amen? Amen. And praise him for mercy that he's extended towards you over and over and over again. Okay. Give me second Samuel now. No, first Samuel chapter two, verse two. We're still on God is our rock. He's enduring. He's strong. He teaches us how to operate in spiritual warfare. He's enduring. He's in strong. We can rely on him. Okay, this is Hannah speaking. She says, no one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. How does she say this? What has she gone through? Y'all know the story of Hannah? Hannah? Hannah was barren and living in her house, as Candace May said, was another <laughs> who had a child. And this woman taunted Hannah to the point that she was humiliated and feeling shame. And she prayed to God. God heard her prayer and she was able to have a child. That child she dedicated to the Lord a child was a prophet named Samuel. Um, in verse 25, she brings Samuel before the Lord. Verse 25 of chapter 1. 
she brings him before the Lord to be blessed. And that's the first chapter, chapter one, first Samuel. There we go. Now, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour and a skin of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. He slaughtered the bull. Give me the next verse. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I'm the woman who stood by you right here praying to the Lord. I love that passage. When God blesses you with a miracle, you ought not ever forget it. And you must go back and thank him for that miracle. And, and she says, I'm the woman. I stood right here a year ago, feeling barren and, and helpless and hopeless. And you turned my situation all around. I'm, I'm that woman. Hallelujah. And some of us can put ourselves in in Hannah's place. Have you ever been in a barren place? Uh, in a place where you felt like you would never have what you desired, but then God stepped in after you prayed and turned it all around. And if you've been there, give him glory. Maybe you didn't understand it from that perspective. And so let me, let me help you. And I, I have to experience things, as I said before I, I, I preach. Yesterday, um, I had an opportunity to listen to uh, a young lady in the Heritage Building who came to us from South Carolina. Her name is Deara Bryant. And what is the place that she's from? Esto, South Carolina. Deara is now pursuing her doctorate's degree in computer science. She's so fluid in her field and her explanation. Uh, God has really blessed her, and she's going in the health industry. So I look, I look to her, and I see that the healthcare industry is going to be greatly impacted by this young lady and the talents, the the mind that God has given her. It's 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 absolutely incredible. Now, she's from this place called Estol, South Carolina. About 80 miles from Savannah. It's about 80 miles from Savannah, Georgia. And it's in between Savannah and, and uh, Augusta, really. So it's, it's just a small town. This. Right. And this, she's Howard and Ruth Taylor's niece and they're, they're really proud of her now they call this place Estol the corridor of shame because there are not many young people who rise up out of Estol to do great things it, it sounds like most of the young people are doomed to failure from Estol. But because this child has 
praying family. God has enabled her to rise up from this place. Amen. 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 I said amen. I said amen. And I, I, I look at her. I see Hannah. I said, that's, that's the woman from Estol. I don't know what your situation is, but of whatever barren place, whatever corridor of shame you came from, I want you to bless God with a haul of your might because he brought you out of that. Praise Yahweh Suri. Hallelujah. God, a rock who's enduring and strong. Hallelujah. I need a minute here. <laughs> Take two. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> Do it. Yes. Yes, Lord. The corridor of shame. Yeah, and he can bring you through that. Has he brought anybody through? Hallelujah. Can you shout, he's my rock? He's my rock. Say it again. He's my rock. Brought me through. I, I wish some young kids, you know, you talk about, you know, Africa and other places around the world. And it's considered a third world country. We have that right here. And it opened up my eyes when I uh, met Ruth. Ruth and I had to go meet her family. That was my first time really going to south. I mean going down south. Atlanta, Georgia is nothing like Estel. I mean there is it's, it's nothing there. It's nothing for the... The kids to do. There's no future, and it's right here in the United States. But that young lady was blessed, you yeah. know. Uh, and she will go back. Believe me, I know. When it said, you know, said and done, that she will be back there to help the kids change. Y'all okay? Let me give you another name. Abba. Can you say Abba? Abba. What does that mean? Daddy. What did you What did you say? Daddy. 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 That's right. Relationship. <laughs> What? That's a relationship. You can't have no relationship with God. Don't say that. No, you can't have no relationship with God. He's my father. Our holy father. Bring tears to my eyes sometimes just to think about it. How merciful. How kind. How loving. How patient. Oh, how he'll help you when you don't have any help. How he's a friend that stick closer than your brother. Water in dry places. Ah, yes, Lord. (laughs) 
They can all over in that corner. <laughs> you know, if they were back in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, and the scribes would have said, Shut them up. I'm an Abba, Father, Daddy relationship. See, in that time, the Pharisees, the scribes, Sadducees were so pious that of even of the name Yahweh, for them, there was a rule that said, you don't say that. You don't say that. And here comes Jesus saying that he was a son of God. And he had a relationship with God. And then he would go over into places like this and teach other folks to pray, Our Father. Our Father. Now, don't you start here. My Father. <laughs> It's personal. See, anybody can be a male, but when there's a father, that means a relationship. That means I don't have to go to the high priest. I can go to him myself. Hallelujah. You know, I can go to him myself. See, and that was the problem with the Sadducees the Pharisees, if they were high priests, and Jesus was teaching them that they no longer had to come through them, that they could have relationship. And he said, I can go to him anytime. And he's daddy. He's personal. He's father. They did not want that for Jesus followers but you notice when I said Abba over there they couldn't hold their peace so when you start talking about Abba Father our God and what he's done for us we can't hold our peace. As a matter of fact, let's give him our best praise right here. Miss Dierra Bryant, can I just interrupt service right here? Because she just walked in from working with the Children's Church. Come on, sweetie, with your auntie. We want to celebrate you and what God has done with you for your life. Come on, everybody, stand to your feet. This is, this is doctor. No. No, 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 no. No, no, daughter. We speak the things that be not as though they are right now. Hallelujah. This is doctor. Brian. Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah. This is Dr. Brian from Esto, South Carolina. And they was telling them they called the place where you come from the corridor of shame. Why do they call it that? It's been recorded that it's one of the worst school districts in South Carolina. Um, after the Industrial Revolution happened, a lot of the factories that took up and left, they left 
this long corridor along I-95 of small towns that were left affected and without resources to upkeep the proper school, um, upkeep the proper school reports and accolades per se. So, yes, very few people end up continuing on to higher education, and the state has come and take over the school several different times, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't call it the corridor of shame. I'm proud to be from Estill, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. I'll say it wherever. So, yes. Yeah. And God is going to use you in a mighty way, and your uncle says that you have a desire, and I know you will, to go back and give hope to those young people that they can. You, you know how you made it through. And God brought you through. Now, you said, you said one thing. Just, just permit me to go off script a little bit here. There was a question in regards to whether robots are going to take over the earth. And, and, and you mentioned something about the robots don't have the ability to, uh, say, grab something and um, hold it in a manner that it should. And you talked about the complexities of the human hand or the human body. Just talk about that for a moment. We're, we're talking about God and him being creator and all of that, all that good stuff. Yes, I think as humans, we get so accustomed to using our hands and using our bodies, all of these things we've learned to do from when we were children. If you just think about picking up a water bottle versus picking up a piece of paper versus picking up a brick, there's so much going on in your mind that's saying how, what shape do I need to place in my hand to pick up this item? How much force do I need to apply in order to lift it, in order to move it to different locations? There's so much math, there's so much that goes into that that when we try to make robots be able to do the same thing, it's very difficult. We can show them how to pick up one item very well, but when we want them to pick up something else that's of different size or shape or um, weight, then it becomes a problem. And so because of that, that was one of the reasons I said that it would be very difficult for robots or a single robot to take over the world. They can't even pick up things of different sizes and other, there were some other reasons I listed too. But yeah, that was one of the main things, looking at how amazing our bodies, our hands and our feet, the way we walk, the way we can move on different terrain. You can walk even in new places. A lot of problems robots can be trained to operate in a single environment. But when we take them into a new environment, then it's very difficult for them to operate because they're not used to that. They haven't seen that before. But the human body is so adaptable to change and can move. You can go to a new city, a new country, drive in a new town and figure out where you, how you need to drive because you know these rules, the way our society works. But robots don't have that. It's very difficult for them. And I could go on and on all day. But <laughs> and I could listen to you all day. Praise God for her. She's remarkable. Amen. Come on over here. Y'all just, just don't go way over there. Just come on over here. Just sit over here next to Jackie. Oh, man. What a day. Everybody shout Abba. Abba. Say Daddy. Daddy. Yeah. It's hard to say it. Let me, let me go underneath Luke 15 for you just for a moment here to give you a different way of looking at that story. You remember the prodigal coming to himself, going back home and his father running towards him? Let me give you just a little more background there. So imagine this. The prodigal is on his way back home. And he steps foot in his village. And in my mind, I see a kid that's playing around someplace, maybe up in a tree, and spots this young man coming. And he goes to tell the rest of the community that here he come. And they form a mob. 
they form a, a, a mob and in their mind, they're going to attack him because in that custom and, and time, when a young man squandered his father's inheritance and wasted it on the Gentiles, that person was to be punished. And then isolated into an island all by himself. So what they did is that this mob got together and um, they literally burn corn, beans, put it in a glass pot, so when he would come crawling into town, it was their aim to throw that pot right in front of him and, and the purpose, yeah, you got that in there? We didn't plan this this morning. It just happened to be in here. And it, it would look like something like this. And so that all of the contents and even the glass would act as a shrapnel to hurt him discourage him and cause him to run away forever. So now that you have that picture, see the father run at daddy. Thank you. Daddy running in front of this mob to protect his son from this danger and not only that you see the daddy not only put a robe on his son but the daddy had on a robe himself a long robe and anybody in that time was not supposed to run with a long robe on that was considered to be taboo and especially for a man and humiliating you didn't do that because it brought attention from that man or from the boy who would run away to that man. He overlooked all of that because this was his child. This was his son who once was lost. You get the picture? When you stray away, and the enemy wants to tear you up, the father steps in on your behalf and covers you, hallelujah, hallelujah. from all harm so that you're safe in the arms of Abba Father. Come on and give him glory all over this place. You can do much better than that. Let me give you last one and, and then we're going to Come to the altar, I promise. Can you shout Yeshua? Yeshua. Say it again. Yeshua. Yasha. Thank you, Daryl. Yasha in Hebrew. Inside of Yasha, that name is a lot. It's power packed my help, my rescue. Inside of there is preservation, victory, healing, salvation. Everybody say Yasha. Yasha. And God has become, as David says, my salvation. Everything that we long for, everything that we need, he has become, he has become my rescuer, my help, 
my defender, my peace, on and on. Can you shout Yasha? Yasha. Which means, which means, of all the names that I've given you, he is, he is more than creator. <laughs> what? And that's enough in itself. That everything that was made, he made it. He is the creator. He created things, but then man fell into sin. And he needed a savior. So then God becomes, you see, our savior. Yasha in Hebrew means salvation. Yasha moved from just being a word to being a name, Yeshua. And the Greek, it's Isis, Isus, or Jesus, from which we get our English word, Jesus. Everybody say, Jesus. Jesus. You know what Jesus means? God is my Salvation. He is everything that I need. Amen. He's, he's more than creator. He is my savior. He is my friend. He is my strength. Praise Jesus in this place. <laughs> Philippians 2 and 10. And we'll end right here. Remember at the start of this series, I reference where Pilate Ask the question, what is truth? Jesus is truth. Amen. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Praise Jesus in this place. This is something that Pilate needed to know, and this is something that everybody needs to know. And what a way to end this series. What a way to celebrate. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those, not just on the earth, but heaven and earth and <laughs> under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Abba. Father, and let's bless him all over this room. Come on, give him glory all over this room. I need my prayer warriors here. I need those of you that know Jesus is Lord. You're not ashamed of the fact that he is Lord. I didn't get to this name, but that he is the Lord of hosts, that he is, he is over all. There's no power that's greater than God. I need those of you that, my God, understand that he has all power.
And whereas in places like, man, Estol, where there's a stronghold of the enemy, and there are powers that say, these kids will never make it. And uh, where there are places like Lincoln Heights, and, and it said, these kids will never make it. There are places like Nazareth, where Jesus came from. They say, nobody will come out of there. And where the people of God stand and they pray, they can break the powers of the enemy by the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So I, I need my prayer warriors just begin to walk all over this place. Just and there are places uh, where the enemy has claimed territories where everybody stand with it enemy has claimed as his own and we're going to begin to bombard those places in the name of Jesus hallelujah